We are recording. <laughs> Young Richard, how are we? Um, we're good. We're we're fine. Um, How's your hair doing? Huh? How's your hair? Well, yeah, I got a, I got a. Uh, well, okay. There's a story about that. So, um, uh, I before I did my my uh, presentation or you know talk in Poland. Let me adjust this here so you can see my hair. Of course, right, since that's what Andy addressed right off the bat. It, it, I, I get so many compliments from chicks, it's amazing. Uh, so so um, I'm in Poland and it's the day before I give my talk and I'm like, yeah, you know, I cut my hair off, my long hair a year ago, but I hadn't, um, done any sort of touch-ups or anything like that so i'm like hey, i should go in and get a, a trim so i walk down from the hotel i come across this shop it's called buzz cuts it's run by two polish chicks you know 20s okay. right, right? Yeah. And i walk in there and they just laugh they laugh at me which you know is great you know and then one of them does my hair um and she's they're both hot uh, it was fun it was hilarious banter i said hey take off that much and um i suppose i could figure out a way to make a joke about that much um but uh, <laughs> but um they did and it was all cool and um so I go do the hiking in Spain. We can talk about that later. And so last week, I'm like, Jesus, you know, it's still down to here and everything. I'm like, it's it's fucking hot here uh, now. I mean, it's it's hotter in late August and September than June yeah. and July, actually, uh, in the mountains. So I'm like almost, I'm pushing 95 degrees here. I don't know what that is in like cunt language. Well, but, ours was 90, we had about 90 today, 91 in the shade. So uh, in, pretty, in, in London? Look at this red. Oh, uh, there you go. There yeah, you go. Oh, so yeah. you, you took your shirt off. I was playing, yeah, I was playing tennis topless in the sun for five hours today, four, four oh. hours. Um, yeah. yeah, yeah. Wow, that's a that's a workout. Yeah. So I go. So there's a there's a there's one barber in town. I like him. He's the one who chopped off my long hair. I go back and I'm I, I go, but he's closed. His shop is closed, even though the sign says it should be open. And I hate that stuff. So I go to one of the the so there's of course there's one barber shop and there's like five salons for women and so <laughs> in town so i go to the one i know and um he's like uh we're booked for weeks why don't you try colleen so i go up to her place and even though she has a, a chick sitting there in whatever they're doing you know um i'm like you know, I need the, I need a haircut. She's like, all right, sit down. I'll, I'll work you in, in and out. And, um, so she, she, so she says, what do you want? I said, just buzz it off all off. She says, no. I said, all right, do what you want then. <laughs> and, uh, and so this is what I got out of it. And, um, in the end, uh, so the barber would have been $18. Um, and I go up there, she says, $28. I said, now, if I was a female, how much would it be? She said, 50 plus. <laughs> Marketing. So, yeah, tell me about your, um, your favorite conversation in, at the convention um, in, um, in Poland. Tell me about, you know, lots of good stuff happened. What was your favorite this, conversation? This actually, the first time we, we communicated back and forth in text, you know, during and after, uh, I, I have to tell you, and we and we have to get, uh, we have to, to, yeah, yeah. I was a little bit pissy last night about where I said, you know, I don't, I don't know if I want to do this. Um, um, and there's, we get into why, you know, this is no holds barred sort of discussion. Yeah. Uh, 
and uh, uh, you know, I can tell you what I, I'm pissed off or, you know, unhappy about or unsettled about whatever. And you can tell me the same. Um, yeah. But um, uh, the, you, you know, Poland, it is, it's a uh, manosphere event and it's my fourth time speaking there. Um, and I was, I, I've always spoke on peripheral issues like diet and, um, finance, philosophy, diet, philosophy, and then financial stuff like trade, like how to get into cryptocurrency stuff. So, and this is the first time I came and gave a talk within the, the, the direct sphere because I saw what Anthony was doing and I was more, you know, I wasn't interested in pick up and, um, you know, um, I do not like the part of the red pill or manosphere that, uh, um, never resonated with me is, you know, you do not, you do not confront this by being a victim and there's so much victimhood right? Victim Olympics and everything. And I detest that. And, mm. and, um, but this time now Anthony has geared it into like patriarchy, you know, uh, man, men, men being themselves being men and shooting for women who are women who understand men and building a family and building a, uh, building a, a familial legacy like, um, uh, duh, <laughs> that's it's kind of like civilization 101 uh if you're in the western side of civilization where uh women aren't chattel uh i don't think women should vote uh but um but they're they're certainly not um just chattel Ch chattel slaves uh and um uh have no standing in the law See, that's an important part about the Muslim world. Uh, they have no standing in the law, so they can be raped and killed basically at will if you just invoke God, you know, or shame or pride or, you know, whatever. Honor, 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 right? Honor. Uh, be honorable. Kill your wife or your daughter. Uh, yes, yeah. very honorable. So what was your favorite conversation? Who was it with, your favorite oh, conversation? Uh, that, so, yeah. <laughs> So that's a long way to get back to what your original question uh, was, is that um, it was an absolute delight, Andy. And I mean, on, you know, he, he didn't get there till very late uh, the night before the, 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 the uh, convention started, because I, he had many connections, some of them were screwed up and all that, uh, getting into uh, Warsaw from from only Lisbon, right? And, uh, but he got there and I saw him the next day in the, uh, the, the breakfast room, which is like um, the most awesome, was the most awesome, um, you know, you know how the U European hotels work with the, with the included breakfast if you, and it's like, but in this case, in this case, it was pretty much like a Sunday brunch that you would go to here in the States and it's 30 bucks a pop, yeah. uh, you know, very, very awesome. And I saw, I see Noah. So the, we had breakfast uh, together the very first day and, and we had, we did the conference. Uh, we, we spoke back to back. I went first and he went second on the second day. And um, that, uh, so I think it was, I think it was the first night that we went out and found a big hunk of meat. And I have a, a, a picture, I'll, I'll show it. I'll put it up uh, where, with Noah across the table from me with a couple nice ribeye steaks. And um, uh, so I had many great conversations, but, uh, and I'm being long-winded here, but it, uh, Noah deserves it. And during his presentation, I was done with mine. And during his, uh, you know, uh, our mutual nemesis, uh, Megan, hooked, you know, basically was the one who 
who had the idea, I guess, or she told them, or Noah and Maurice. Maurice didn't get in, but I don't, I don't really think he's appropriate for that. Maurice is a one. He's at Burning Man right now, by the way. In, right off, uh, not not you know, a couple hours from my hometown, Reno, Nevada, uh, in Gerlach, Nevada. And um, uh, anyway, uh, Moritz didn't get in, but Noah did, and I pushed it with Anthony a lot. And so I go up to Anthony while Noah is speaking. He speaks. He he gave a, an amazing talk on agency, and not only did that, but he has a course in agency which he gave away for free for all the guys there. And he, he didn't, he's like, it's hard when you have to drill down and ask yourself all this stuff. It's hard. It's a hard test. And uh, so I love that. But, uh, but the, but the very cool part is I walk up to Anthony as Noah is speaking. He looks at me. He's like, he's like, he's excellent. I'm like, I told you. <laughs> right. And so that was a, it was just a perfect moment for him and uh, I think that Noah will be speaking. Otherwise, so many guys, uh, you know, it's hard to say um, because I had, unlike all the others, I'd, three times I'd spoken out before, and I'm kind of a loo. I stayed on my own. I do my own thing. This time I was like down in there because I was speaking on my, the title of my talk was The History and Cancer of Feminism. And so I'm right in there with all the guys and um, Anthony Johnson does great picks. So I wouldn't want to single anyone out except for uh, Noah. And I wouldn't, I would, on the other hand, I would also not, I would also say that there were no bad presentations. I mean, one guy, he spoke, he's an Englishman. Um, uh, I, I'd have to, uh, 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 try to remember his name and everything, but he came out from London. He was talking about, you know, how he started earlier and he's like picking up chicks and, and everything. He gets really good at it. And, but he evolved and, and I'm listening to it and I'm thinking he could retitle the, I forget what the name of his presentation was, but he could retitle it as to how to talk to people. And because in the, in the end, it doesn't matter. I mean, it's, it's, the point is, is get it out of your mind that, oh, she's so hot, I have to have her, whatever. And it's like, it's another person. It's like, you get, you talk to, uh, you go to Starbucks or, you know, coffee shop or the grocery store or whatever, and you're dealing with someone over the counter, uh, it could be the, the, it could be a nine out of 10, um, because tens never have to do that. They just go to Hollywood or whatever. But so it's a nine out of 10 and you're, um, you talk to them fine because you're doing a transaction, right? So if you go out and you just talk to people, fat, old, ugly, young, old, um, and just talk to people, then, then a hot chick is uh, never, never like, what what's the old, word psychs you out all right so what what are you up to Andy? you you were out drinking when i when because we had a little exchange and you're out drinking and after playing tennis for five hours in the sun and i'm like okay all right well you know because i was like i expressed trepidations about continuing this discussions thing and um and you're like yeah it's fun let's keep doing it all right I said, okay, let's go have a, let's, I'll get, I'll catch up with your inebriation because you were out drinking. So how much did you drink? Okay. Well, it all started on, um, in June when uh, Nadal was playing the final of the French Open for tennis. And I met these, this group of Spanish people who got me into a game called paddle, which is kind of tennis mixed with squash. And then I went to Madrid and I played it there and I won, uh, and then I came, and then the, a girl that I met just flew back from Madrid, stayed with me for three days, and uh, we played in separate Hyde Park. bedrooms. So what? Separate bedrooms. I, 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 it's impossible to tell, you know. <laughs> <laughs> um, but we did play paddle, and then you know I've just been playing a lot of tennis, a lot of paddle, and um, 
staying, basically I've, I've started doing running. I've started, I've never jogged in my life, but I'm just going to do it for the next three months because I want to see how quickly I can run three miles in. Uh -huh. um, just give myself maybe three months, see how quickly I can do it, uh, just as, as a target. Uh, yeah, I'm flying out to Menorca soon, September 15th. Just well, you were just there a couple, three months ago, was it? Yeah, yeah, it's, it's um, in the Mahon uh, Cove, the, co the Cove of Mahon. It's a mm -hmm. good place for, for two, yeah, yeah it's, it's a good spot. What? When you first said that, I thought, okay, maybe the English have a different way of saying Mallorca than Menorca or whatever. But then I looked it up on the map, so they're two separate places. Yeah, yeah. The, the bigger one is Mallorca, where Nadal is from, and the small one is Menorca. And that's yeah. also where they're called the Balearic Islands. Um, yeah, so I just wanted to get onto the... Th I never usually talk about gossip, it just bores me, but this Facebook thing. So Kurt gets banned or deleted. No, he gets deleted. You get deleted, and then also... Well, Angus, Angus, not Richard, Angus. The, oh, Angus, got, okay, that's fine. So Richard just did it. How about, when are you yeah, back? Yeah, no, you? I have, I have uh, t uh, this week, uh, uh, oh, in a week, I'll be back. But I have a different strategy going forward because I'm, you know, it's my 17th band. It's like, come on, people. Um, uh, and I dis, I, I become... Um, more and more um, disenchanted, I should say, um, with Facebook in general. And I'm not talking, I'm not really talking uh, politically. It's just, it's just a, such a children's story. Sorry. You know, yeah. It's such yeah. a children's story. Um, and I'm a very, very seasoned blogger going back to 2003. I'll be putting on my 5,000th post um, probably in a few months to come because I'm kind of on fire about it. And I'm like, you know what? Facebook was a, a nice, cool experiment. I know how you get it. But I used to have, I, I used to put up, post that would have two, 300 comments on the mm -hmm. post. It's like, why give that to Cuckerberg? Mm -hmm. um, and so, it, so you know, I, I thought, well, let's see where this goes. And I get enamored of it because you can always jump on there and, and get some action going if you don't want to be like on TV or you don't have any friends around or anything, both of which are better. Um, probably at least uh, having friends around i i had that this weekend i didn't look at facebook a bit hardly right and um so it's 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 very nice to have a, a true um social circle i went up to my brother's house on um okay let me digress just a bit here andy if you would uh, let me so you You've seen my you see my cooking videos, and I love. This is what I was going to talk about. Yeah, go, 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 wait, give me a pause. I've just got to put something out in the oven. I'll be thirty All seconds. Right. Thirty All seconds. Right. Thirty. And he's gone. Well, I should say something while he's gone, at least. Okay, so, um, and he'll have to see it on the playback. Um, but, um, you know, he's a cunt. I want you to know that before he, oh, oops, he's back. <laughs> I, yeah, everything's fine. But, um, yeah, I think no, it was I about like, I just put some chicken in the oven, so I'm going to eat in 30. Oh, I've got to put the alarm on my phone, and then life is good. You, um, yeah, so tell me, tell me, what's the story with your cooking? While, while, while you were gone, I told everybody that you're a cunt, but I forgot to say he's a proper cunt. So I'm just prefacing uh, yeah, that right funny. now. What? Oh, nine. I'm just counting numbers in my head. It's 35. Uh, my, my oven cooks quickly, you see, so you have, to, you have to estimate down. Anyway, yeah, so the cooking, what I've been doing is just loads of mushroom sauces. I've just been making like chopping garlic, chopping onions, and then putting different amounts of mustard in or different amounts of um, stock, either go with the chicken or with the beef, but probably chicken. And then, you know, with water, all that sort of stuff. Put that in. Unsalted stock, right? 
Is that better? Yes, because if you reduce, you're reducing water. So if it's a yeah. salted stock, that's meant to do, that's meant for like a soup base. Yeah, right. true. So, true. Okay, so we'll so basically if you're going to it into a sauce, it's going to get saltier and saltier and saltier as you remove moisture from it. Okay, well that's tip number one for everyone and for me because I didn't do that. Anyway, so I got that yeah. wrong. But then I've tried different things like um, well mushrooms I, I do in it, but the last one I did it without mushrooms, and then I tried a bit of um, radish that didn't work at all. Then I tried some carrots. But radishes, I really radishes, do, radishes don't work in, radishes work in salads and just eat radishes, right? It's kind of like turnips or, uh, you know, um, there's some like kohlrabi uh, you, can, you can work with in cooking. But in general, you know, mirepoix, uh, you know, um, onions, uh, carrots, uh, celery, always works in almost any dish and you can work with it <coughs> whatever proportions you know onions carrots celery and garlic yeah, is just know, a classic french right. mirepoix you know so, yeah uh, it's also called sofrito in italian if you add garlic it's sofrito yeah yeah, yeah and garlic as well you know and of course mushrooms depending on the application and everything but the the, the what you use in a dish it, what's appropriate unless you're being crazy like I do crazy stuff too. Like for instance, pork and fruit go very well together. I mean, the first time I did this, it was, I did carnitas, which is a pork that's kind of cooked in its own pork fat. And I used persimmons. So, so, and then I, then I did another one where I did with cherries, pork and fruit go very, very well together. So that's, that's a great um, area of experimentation for cooking. Mm -hmm. And I, you know, it's, I, I was surprised. I think, I think you were su as surprised about my cooking videos as I was surprised that you tend to like them, right? Yeah, I just, I just really enjoy it because I've got, um, I've got some friends, one who's a, a two-star rosette chef and another one who's cooked every night for years. Well, don't show him my videos. He'll tell you you're fucked up. Uh, no, no, I, did. I, showed, I showed one of them, my friend Jim, one of your videos and uh, he said it was good. It was the... Um, I think it was the ovary. It was the the, the egg. Yeah. The scratch soy. The oh you know, the my my over the oh, top over easy egg thing, right? Sorry, over easy egg. Yeah, that was good. And yeah. also we watched. Um, oh, I can't remember another one. But yeah, what I've been doing at the moment is bolognese. So I've been getting um, uh, three types of meat, getting the whole sofrito thing going. You know, those four: so garlic, um, onions. Uh, actually, was it was it? Uh, I think it was carrots in this one and celery. Mm -hmm. And then you know, heating them up probably probably the um, the carrots and the onions first, and a bit of garlic, you know, celery, all that stuff. And then putting in uh, the the three meats like like press. So the three meats being probably pork sausage, um, just normal beef mince, and then the the third one is a choice. You can pick one of any other meat you like. So I just do different ones each time. And then you you know tomato paste uh, and the tomato. Um, you know, I'm not totally saying the exact order, then you put the tomatoes in, and then basically a bit of mustard as well, some Worcester sauce, not much Worcester sauce, some butter. I put sort of intermittent bits of you butter. Call it Worcester sauce? We try to, we try to yeah. pronounce the whole thing. We're Chestershire. <laughs> yeah, Worc Worcestershire sauce. And then am I missing anything? I'm probably missing one or two ingredients from there. Uh, Oh, what mushrooms. I, I, like to do, I like to do mushrooms in two forms. So I cut them into small pieces, and I cut them into fine, thin pieces. Yeah. Um, then yes, and probably some, maybe some tomatoes. I'm, I'm not trying to critique you at all. In fact, I want to uh, highlight something you talked about, which is tomato paste. Tomato paste is a great thing to have around a because it's 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 hyper concentrated tomato, right? And so you know, if you, you yes, you can add fresh tomato to a dish, but they mm. have bread. It's like watermelon, a seedless watermelon. That's a whole other story from Warsaw where I love the watermelon because they have like the classic black seeds in them and they taste wonderful. Like I, I ate so much watermelon. I can't believe it. But here I don't, I never buy it because they're seedless and they're seedless means flavorless, I guess. I don't know, but they're like, it's, it's red water. Right. So, um, and same with tomatoes, they bread out all the flavor unless you get heirlooms, 
but heirlooms, I should say. But those are only available for a few months a year. Otherwise, I only get Romas. They still have a little flavor in them, right? But getting to tomato sauce, at least it's concentrated, or not sauce, but paste. And you can, it's kind of like a bouillon paste, right? So you can take a little bit out, add a, whatever, in, in whatever, you could even make a curry dish just to give it that little bit of acidic flavor. It's brilliant. Uh, so so uh, it's, it's great that you, you're using that. So I didn't want to critique anything you said, but I wanted to say that that's a great thing to have in your cupboard. Have a few cans of tomato paste. Right. Yeah, so what I did is I'll, do it, I'll, make, I'll make a video of what I did with the bolognese, but what I do is I cooked it about two years ago for my girlfriend at the time, and then she gave me some advice on what to do from her opinion, then for my dad, then my sister, then my, another friend, and I kept getting feedback from people, and I just adjusted it slightly and worked on it and worked on it, and about two years later, it, you know, it turned into quite a good dish. Well, you know, um, so to go back, it's like, you know, I do these cooking videos and, and just a, a, a quick side story is that, you know, a year or so ago, I thought, well, I'm going to do a, a cooking Patreon. So I put it up. I immediately got like 10, 20 subscribers. So I'm immediately making like 50 bucks a month. But, you know, that's where it grows. I grew my Bitcoin one from zero subscribers. Um, to uh, 500 um, at five bucks a month, so I, uh, or 600. I was pulling in more than three thousand dollars a month in five months of just from just starting. The thing is, is that it got to be a, the the cooking thing. It's like it takes all the joy out of it for me. So now I like to just you know I snap in the iPhone on the camera. I do it. And I don't have any sense about like, I have to do this for subscribers. It's like, if they don't like it, fuck off. I don't care. Well, my sense when I watch your videos on cooking is that you've got some experience with it because I tried to do one the other day with my sauce and I just, I was fumbling the camera. I didn't know what I was doing and yours are quite clear. So obviously you've got, you know, you've done it before. Well, it, it's, it's, it's not so much. I think I've cooked, I've cooked so much. I've been cooking all my life. I mean, I've been cooking since I was nine years old, really. Um, my mother and her whole family are excellent cooks, home cooks, right? So I grew up with, I grew up with grandmothers, like, cooking. And, um, you know, I was, I, was, I was never in the kitchen helping, but I always observed. And then as soon as I got out on my own, I, I just cook stuff. You know, you, I can't tell you how many times I go, I've gotten laid because um, I cooked something and a, one, a chick was like, nobody's ever done that, right? And then they get like a crazy awesome frittata or omelet in the morning. So that's that really seals the, the goes down well. And um, by the way, if, if Noah and I and other people do this conference next year, are you are you going to definitely, definitely book flights and come? There's oh yeah, yeah. Well, so okay, so yeah, we have to do. We have to talk about. I sent you a text last night. I'm like, I'm not. I, I don't know about this discussions thing. And mm -hmm. you, you, to your credit, you didn't like whine and cry. You're like, no you'll be back and everything. So I'm like, I liked your response. And so I was like, all right, um, let's continue. So let me tell you what I dislike about what we die. It's only like, well, we did a, a couple, you know, one or two trials and then we set off. Um, number one that I don't like is I do not like four people. And the reason I don't like four people is because one always gets overshadowed and they look bad and I feel bad that they look bad. And both, okay. but two or, uh, we did two or three with uh, four people and there's, there's like the star of the show and then there's like the, uh, you know, um, uh, you know, ugly stepchild kind of thing. And, uh, and particularly when there's, audio issues involved with that. I, I feel sorry for a couple of those guys. I'm not going to name any names. Um, 
so that's one thing. I think it should be it should be Richard, Andy, and and we just we just jump on one person and soak them for everything they're worth. Um, yeah, and I think they cool. would they would like that better too because they're just the unequivocal star of the show. Um, that's number one thing I that I didn't like very much. Um, I could see it doing doing it every once in a while if you have like two people at total parity, you know, yeah. right? And they're and you bring them on for them to go at each other, kind of. Really, that would be cool. That would be cool. Um, the other thing is that um, I look at the the YouTube views, and I mean. It's just not going there and I don't want it to be something for a bunch of Kurt's uh, basement wankers um, to, to I see what well, I would rebut that is it's just for me we'd, we're just doing it as a project just to kind of experience different things and try it out you can always build from it or you can change it but it's it doesn't matter I wouldn't look at it like a, a return we're not getting re a return is the experience yeah right um, it's so I don't mind doing like the esoteric stuff. And I, by the way, uh, I think the interview with Casey, people are missing out if they haven't watched, uh, um, um, I, it's Casey, right? Yeah. Dr. Casey. Yeah. Yeah. yeah Dr. Mm -hmm. Casey. Right. And that was the last one we did before I headed off to Poland. And I think that is pristine. I've watched it a couple of times. And that is, that is just a, a, a phenomenal gentleman. And that's what I like about him the best. He's such, he's such just a gentleman. And, and, and it goes back to what I talk about, about the, uh, the manosphere stuff and everything. It's like, it's like, man, you know, what we really need in society, I think, in my opinion, Right. You, you can have people who strap bombs to themselves and, you know, rape their, kill their wives and daughters and all that stuff if you want. But I'm like, how about a guy like this? How about you chicks look for a guy like this when he's like 20 years old or something like 20, 30 years old? Look for a guy like this because because that 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 sort of a man will never do you wrong, really. He's not going to do you wrong, and that's what I—that's what I really loved about that in particular. Yeah. How, how many more on this list of dislikes? Because it's quite long. Oh, it's quite long. Well, I my speak. No, that's only two things. Uh, okay, one more. One more. Probably the um, is that when I went off to Warsaw. Yeah. And I was amazed. I've lived abroad for eight years in my whole life, right? Five years in Japan and two years in Europe in the south of France, right? I traveled all over. And I, I'm experiencing this, I hadn't been out, I hadn't, well, I'd been out of the country to Mexico only, uh, but I hadn't been to Europe in like 10 years. Um, and uh, exactly 10 years, pretty much. And uh, I'm doing this trip and it's, it's, it's a two part, which are radically different. And I do not check baggage. <laughs> I don't. So I have to figure out how do I do a week and then another week with everything I need on with carry on. How do you do it? Right. So I figured that all out. That's not, I'm not, gonna, I'll do that when I'm like blogging about it. But, um, I loved the trip so much and the anxiety was kind of, it was light anxiety, which was light enough to kind of make me laugh at myself enough to talk to other, other folks and everything. And then I go there and I'm like, I'm like day one, I'm like going all over doing stuff. And, and then Spain, I mean, that yeah, what was, that? how did that go? Oh God. I love Spain. It's very anarchist, anarchic. Um, they're not flag wavers. It's kind of like, well, why weren't they big involved in World War II? And what was this whole Franco thing with the 
with the, uh, it's, it's, so I start to think about all this. And I, I'm, I was in the Alpuara, which is the Moors area. So every building was built between 800 and 1300 and they're still standing. Right. And, and, um, the, the, on the, the first day, so we were like at about a 4,000 foot, so 1500 meter, roughly, um, you know, less and more, 4,000 to 6,000 to 3,000, you know, kind of in that area, hiking across the mountain range of the Alp Alpara, which is south of Granada. So I'm reading a book at the time uh, by uh, Gerard Brennan, an Englishman who, after World War One, this is, we're talking 1920s, he came back and he went and lived there. And the, our first village stop was the village he, uh, I can't remember off the top of my head, but we went and saw his house. It has a plaque on it, right? But that's a great book. Uh, and he's quite a shit-stirring uh, personality himself. He's kind of a muckraker sort of guy. So he went there. And we're talking, yeah, you, you, there's no roads. You get in there by donkeys and all this stuff. So I'm, I'm, li I'm kind of living this history, and I'm trying to understand it. And I realize that the most pristine village of them all, which is wonderful, um, um, that... I could rent a one bedroom apartment with good internet for $450 a month. Mm. And it start, it begins to change my whole perspective. Having lived abroad and everything, I have no fear of being anywhere. <clears throat> Got it. So, so what it ended up being was like life changing, a complete change of focus. So once I sell this place that I'm living in right now, which I hope is soon. Um, and uh, I'm, I'm going nomad. Uh, I, I was going to do like this travel to the U S in a, in a camper van that I made and build shipping container houses and so on. There is a, um, there's a site called nomad list and it's so happy nomad list.com. It so happens that a friend of a friend of mine created that site. So there are hundreds of places all over the world with all sorts of reviews, but the data collection is immense and it's great. Um, yeah, you can, there's hundreds of places you could live and I'm talking room and board and food and a maid and everything for like a thousand bucks a month. Right. Yeah, the, the girl I went to that came to flew to me from Madrid, she actually comes from Granada. So she comes from probably like a few miles north of where you were. Yeah. yeah. So if you do end up living down there. I'll, I'll uh, probably... uh, Spain is too. <coughs> Spain is. Um, <coughs> Spain is a bit expensive. I love it. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> um, but it's not, you know. I'm going to go live in Vietnam. That's going to be my first stop. So that's how wildly different. So it's just a change. But I, I spent months in Thailand. So, uh, you know, I want to do, I want to do Vietnam. I always want to do Vietnam, Cambodia, and even Laos. You know, when I went to Vietnam, I, a lot of the chicks I met, or not Vietnam, when I went to Thailand and spent months there, well, not months at a time, you know, a month here, a month there, a month there. I did it that three times and then, but you know, a lot of the, the women that I met were actually not Thai. They were Laotian, Laotian. So uh, I'm interested to go to, what is it? Viet, uh, Vietian, I think is the capital of Laos. So, you know, <laughs> so yeah, I'm, going to, I'm that... going to go very wild off grid. And now that there is, um, Internet is reasonably workable most places. It's very good in Vietnam, from what I hear. Um, uh, less so in Cambodia, but I could do like a week jaunt and just like snap a lot of photos and then, you know, come back and, and write about. It. So that's what I want to do. I want to do a adventure sort of stuff and write about it in a very unique uh, Richard Nikolai free the animal style, not like bullshit um 
uh, and a, the guy I was hiking with in um, in uh, the guy I was hiking with in Spain, um, uh, Paul, or he would prefer that I call him Pablo. Um, he's an old Navy buddy since 1988, and we've seen each other. He's a he's a he flew across the country to come to my wedding in 2001. Um, and this, I, this, this is the first time I saw, I've seen him in maybe 18 years, 15 years, 18 years, something like that. He picked me up at the airport. We went, we did the thing, but he is, he's done this all over the world. It's adventure travel. So he is, he's a nine time contributor to, uh, a lot of people know the book series, uh, lonely planet. So he would go off and do, so he is, he has, he's nine times uh, huge things where they, he goes off for four to six weeks. It takes a month of planning, then four to six weeks. And they, he goes off and does um, a whole thing and writes it all up. And we're talking, we're not talking about going on a Disney cruise. We're talking about like hiking from the, from the East, coast of Madagascar to the west coast through the jungle with a machete. Um, what did you do? What did you get done in there? What did you do with him? Uh, he, was my, he, was my, he was my buddy for that Spanish, the hike in Spain, the five days uh, in the Alto Ara. So that was, um, that, that's why I, I bring it up. And so I'm taught, he, he's not doing it for Lonely Planet anymore. But, um, but we talked about it and I'm like, you know, I, I met, when I met him, he was a new Navy officer headed to flight school in Pensacola, fly jets. And they sent him out for three months. I was on seven fleet staff. And so uh, he showed up at the right time when we were going on basically a, an Asian tour. We, were, we went from Yokosuka to uh, two or three ports in Japan, then Philippines, and then um, uh, didn't do Korea. We went to from we went we went to uh, Singapore. We're in Singapore. We went to Penang, Malaysia. We went to Jakarta, Indonesia. Um, a bunch yeah, where did you go in Malaysia? Did you go to Kuala Lumpur? No, I've only been to Penang. Okay. Yeah, I like Malaysia. It's a good spot. The ringgit, that's their currency, the ringgit. Yeah. Ringgit, yeah. <laughs> it used to be six ringgit to a pound, but that was well, in 2003. The, the, the first day we arrived, Paul and I, we got to one of those rickshaws with the uh, bicycle peddler behind, and yeah. he took us all over. And uh, hit, I still remember his name is John because he told us a million times, my name is John. You can call me John, right? So we we did a you know back in the day. This this is 1988. You have the big video cam, so I, you know we record it. But then the next day we went our separate ways, and he had um he had a taxi guy take him around, and then at lunchtime he said, "Hey, let me take you to lunch, but I want you to take me to lunch where you go to lunch, and I'll pay for it." Right? So good. The next day he took me there. So. And we got this like curried, kind of a curried, whole Dungeness crab. It took me mm-hmm. three hours to eat the whole thing. I had to suck out every little piece of uh, thing. D- crab is my favorite. I'm training, I'm training for this two kilo um, steak competition. See how basically I've got to, I've got to eat two kilos of steak in about five minutes. That's um, five pounds. Five pounds in five minutes. A pound a minute. Eh. Tough. I mean, I, I'm pretty tough. I can, I can, I can eat pretty fast, but don't be fast. And what you should do is eat five, five pounds the day before, and then vomit it out. Do go, go Bellini on it. No, no, no. no. I'm doing this. <laughs> like, no. Have you, you th- those cooking com- competitions or the eating competitions are hilarious. I mean, like there's this, this like small Korean chick. Who can like down like how many hot dogs? It's crazy. <laughs> yeah. Maybe I should do it online and, and anyone can join and anyone who you know who beats me can can I'll pay for their steak. <laughs> yeah. So 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 uh, give me shit about something. 
Okay, well, what what the fuck, man? What, what are you doing? What are you doing? Like not selling your house yet? What are you doing? Like not dropping the price by a few grand to get it get it sold? No, I've done that already. Um, uh, so uh, th that's it's. So I I try to be clever and go with like an online sort of broker, not yeah. realizing that I'm not urban or suburban, but I'm rural and. Um, basically the agents up here just don't work with don't do that right so i can't can't get typically you want a buyer's agent they get three percent um to help sell it and but they the the real estate community up here is small enough um that they can basically work their own listings and usually get both sides it's here in America, it's 6%. So the seller's agents three and the buyer's agent three, but a lot of them sell their own listings so they can get both sides uh, uh, as long as you disclose it and everything. So, so I, I fucked up. I did. I'm not going to deny it, but so my listing expires uh, a week from today. Um, and uh, I will be, I talked around town. I went, what I did is I went around town, all the business owners I know, like the auto shop, the coffee shop, the, the, the brewery. I know all these guys. Right. So I'm like, I like asked them, you know, who would you list your property with? And the answer was very, very clear. And so I have already contacted, it's actually a team, a, a team of, of sisters to, uh, uh, two sisters that uh, that do this for a particular brokerage in town, and the word is that they sell tr three times as many houses as anyone else in town. So well, I've already I wonder talked. why. I wonder what they're doing in return for these what? sales. <laughs> <laughs> You're nice. drunk, man. <laughs> so do you think you've had your last summer there? Do you think you know this is? Oh the yeah, last yeah. Oh, for sure. For sure. If, if, if not, I'll do something else. I'll turn it back into a vacation rental. Uh, it was, uh, I had it as a vacation rental for five years. Um, and I, uh, it was rented every weekend of the year and most of the week during in ski season. See, it's a, it's a, it's a two season place. So there's a ski season because the ski resort is like 30 minutes up the road. And mm -hmm. then, the whole gold country and wineries and everything are 30 minutes down the road or 15 actually. Uh, like, so I had it rented all the time. I would make, I would, so, so it's, it's, so I would, I would make three times as much as I could make on a conventional rental. I made 35,000 a year on this house. Okay, Richard, what I want you to do is something quite cool because I got to get my food out. It's going to take me about two minutes. I want to put some stuff on it. I want you to tell the camera while I'm not here how you make scrambled eggs, and then I'm going to tell you when I'm back how I make them. I'll be back in two minutes. All right. Okay, how do you make scrambled eggs? Well, you know, there are, there are uh, a few different ways. Um, uh, the, the way the restaurant make it is uh, fast and furious you know um it's it's medium to high heat and butter and you you know put the eggs in and you, typically they're they're whipped right so are you they you whip them in a bowl so you put them in and they get done pretty quick everything yeah season them they're okay um, some people do not like any sort of softness or runniness in their scrambled eggs. So that's uh, perfect for them. Um, then there is the low and slow method where you have like a, uh, it's best to use a nonstick for this application and you put in the butter, but it's all in low heat. The panties mean hot when you put the, it's not, well, it's hot, but it's low heat hot. You put those in and you use a rubber spatula and you just keep working it. It's kind of like making a risotto. You just keep working it and it slowly, slowly congeals. Um, but it's not, the, it, it's decidedly different. It's different taste, different texture, 
than if you do them like the hard and fast way. Uh, you can also do them sous vide, but the problem with sous vide is that it turns out that um, the proteins in the white um, congeal at a, you know, get hard at a lower temperature than do the ones in the, or at a higher temperature, I'm sorry, higher temperature than do the proteins in the yolk, right? So what you end up with, if you do it that way, is a little bit runniness and it's the white that's runny if you do sous vide. Um, and same thing with trying to do a boiled egg sous vide. It doesn't work very well because to get the, the white hard, you have to end up congealing the yolk because the yolk, the yolk congeals at a lower temperature than the whites. And right? Um, and the other, well, bain-marie is a French method, but it's, it's basically the same thing as the low and slow. You're just, you're just doing it from a, a double boiler and everything. All right, Andy, uh, your turn to tell me how you do scrambled eggs. I think he's going to be back in a second. Yeah, I got myself a knife. So, what did you explain? How did how did how you make scrambled eggs? I, I told him, you know, the the cafe method. You know, just hard and fast, high high heat. Da, da, da. But you know, my my former wife likes them. She can't stand any runniness in scrambled eggs. And sometimes I like them, especially on a piece of toast. You know, a, a, a kind of a rubbery, hard chunk of egg, like you get in like a cafe or or if you're out and about and, and something. Yeah. So what I, what I do is this, I get a pan and I get it pretty hot. Then I get a big slab of butter. It doesn't matter how much you just, I put it in there and I will crack a number of eggs, usually like eight eggs, six or eight eggs into a, into a thing. And either I have two options. One that I whisk it before the other, I don't. One is yes. more. Either way. So either I, way. Yeah. The, the, the butter is both also have, non both, both have merit. Both ways. Yeah, have the, merit. the butter is also unsalted butter. So it doesn't yes. uh, ruin the eggs. I, I never use salted butter because you can always add salt. Yeah, so uh, then I put it in over, over a, a high heat, uh, pour the eggs in, and then I'm basically constantly moving it, constantly moving it, and then I'm pulling it off the heat, but the time that I put it on the heat is, is longer at the beginning and the time off is shorter, so then I take it off, I just keep moving it around, and you're always trying to cook everything reasonably evenly, obviously not burn a bit, then on, then off, then on, and off, until you get almost done, and then you pull it off, and you want to kind of cook it really mainly cook it off the heat and then yes. when it when it's finally just before it's ready keep folding it over and um uh, what's his name thingy that gordon. we both video he gordon likes ramsay. to put in sorry gordon ramsay yeah oh hold on a sec hold on a sec hello ed he, ed might come on the show hello ed? hello hey andy how, how are you ed would you like to um come on the zoom thing i can i'm i'm really not feeling too well today but i uh, can uh well, come and have a chat for 15 minutes if you want. Okay. Brilliant. Well, um, I'm opening the Zoom link right now. I'm, t I'm explaining how to make scrambled eggs, okay? So, so have a listen. Well, because it's, you know, it's genius. Okay. So anyway, so I put the eggs in, and then at the end, you're folding them over, and Gordon Ramsay puts in creme fraiche. I don't. Yeah. I will add it with, I'll have it with, like, I don't know, some bacon or some whatever other stuff you're putting it with, um, on toast or whatever, whatever you want. And it's it's light and fluffy, and it's like rich, and it's right. yellow. It's not you know it's, it's exactly. It's you put milk in it. Um, anyway, that's that's how I mix scrambled eggs. If you do, if you so like that, like Gordon Ramsay's method, uh, you know, um, you put the butter in, it's just cold butter and the, your couple eggs, right? And then you start whipping them up under the heat. Right, and it's not very long. Once they, once that pan gets hot enough, they will continue to cook, and you keep whipping them. And he, he made a good. Uh, he, he said, he said a good thing. It's like it's kind of like a roast risotto. You don't stop. You can't. It's like making a classic risotto. You cannot stop stirring. You have to stir. Yeah, I never stop stirring ever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 And and that's 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 uh, that's really gets you a really good. Um, sort of a product and and um, also uh, I have found it to be true because and this is this is the big thing because I've done them different ways before I saw that 
But the big thing he said is he says you don't season until the end because the salt ends up breaks pulling the egg. water. It pulls water out of the yolk, so it breaks it. It breaks it down, and you do not get as good of a result. Um, and That's true. Probably maybe only a chef could tell, but if you do it all the time, you can say, "Oh, this works better." if I do it this way. And of course you always want to do everything you do better the next time, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. Right. Natural, natural human. And if, if you, if you're not like that, you should, uh, you're fucked, right? You should always look at, um, at, uh, how you could do better. Right. So. so Richard, you're, you're probably a couple of hundred miles North and maybe 50, or I don't know how many miles, um, West of, um, Prescott in uh, Arizona, are you? No, no, uh, Prescott, Pre I've been to Prescott, Arizona, yeah. I used to have a, a, a business associate there. So I've driven from Las, uh, Las Vegas to Prescott and back. Uh, that's about two, 200 each way. To drive down to Prescott, Arizona would be like an eight hour drive, right? So um, you ought to like just plug in Arnold, California. Sorry, where do you live again? Maps. And where do you live? Oh, he's there. Yeah, yeah. I, I was just telling him, where do you live in Ar Arnold, California? Arnold, California. Look it yeah, up. Yeah, Arnold, California. Look it up on the map. No, I'm, I'm so I'm like 300, uh, three hours drive uh, directly east of San Francisco, but in the, in the Sierras at 4,000 feet. So 1,500 for you, uh, for you English wankers. <laughs> So Ed's on. I see. I see Ed on. So I'm like, I've, I've got to like turn it up a little bit because I know nothing about him, right? But oh, Ed, wait, is Ed online? Is Ed on now? Yeah, he's, he's here. Say something, Ed. Is my microphone working? Is it working? Yeah, you're working fine, Ed. So my my introduction to Ed is that he's my best friend, and we've known each other since we were 14, 14 and a half, uh, and our meeting was in a computer room where I. Um, I accosted him. I said, you've got to play this game. It's about you rent aliens and you build them up and you get these points. You know, we were 14. So it was a geeky meeting. And then um, I went to America sailing with him and his family. And we just became good friends. And, but he got a degree in, God, let me get this phrase. It, physics. You started mechanical engineering at Imperial and then you changed to, was it physics? Then I, I changed to physics and then I changed to theoretical physics at the end. Okay, so then you did that, and then and now he lives in. Uh, that was probably ten years ago now, but now he lives in uh, Prescott, Arizona. And no way! No fucking way! Really? Hey, Andy, yeah. I'm gonna go. I'm gonna go have a smoke, and I'm gonna refill my drink. See if you can troubleshoot his his audio is really super weak, and so maybe it'll be best if he just unplugs that thing and just goes on the straight compute because that's what I do, and it always works really well. So I'll be back in two. Yeah. Um, so, Ed, how's how's Arizona treating you? Good. Is 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 my microphone still pretty weak? It is pretty weak. Yeah. He says if you unplug everything, it should be better. Let me. Try. Okay. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Good volume. That's good. Way better. All right. <laughs> and then, how about now? Is it still weak? Now it's weak. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm tucking into just half a chicken. I'm just eating half a chicken while I'm talking to you. It's kind of brilliant. There's nothing, nothing quite like chicken. Well, nice steak. Um, yeah, how's Arizona? What's, what's happening? The weather, the weather in London at the moment is very hot, so I don't know what it's like with you. Um, actually, right now, it's one of the hottest days of the year here in Prescott. It's uh, 95 degrees. Um, it was up to almost 100. Ours was at 91 today. We hit a high of 91. But tomorrow is going to be tomorrow is going to be a lot cooler. Um, yeah, what are you doing in terms of are you you doing exercise at the moment? Are you keeping fit? Yeah, I'm trying to. My my schedule is so irregular. Wait, hold on. Let me take the. Um, my schedule is so irregular that it's hard to like get a consistent pattern. I usually get to the gym, you know, once or twice a week on average. Um, I've just started to try redoing uh, the running thing, which I haven't done for. Got about a year and a half now. Um, but uh, yeah, no, it's coming along. I'm still 
plateaued. I, I've been stuck between 145 and 150 pounds for the last year or two. It's hard to break. About 10 and, 10 and a half, 10, three, how many stone is that? Um, yeah, it's about 10 and a half. Yeah, that's about 140 pounds is 10 stone, so, um, okay. yeah. So, what do you, what's, how's, your, how's the business going? It's going well. We've got, um, you know, I started two new businesses in the last few months. Um, they're both doing okay. The, uh, the main business, we've been hit by the FDA. Um, they've, they've been messing around for years now trying to figure out how they want to regulate um, electronic cigarettes. Yeah. And uh, they got sued in court by a couple of nanny groups um, to push up the deadline. And then they they basically folded. So now we're we're uh, our lobby groups are counter suing now that there's actually material damage potential, so we can actually make a case. Um, but yeah. our current deadline is May 2020 to okay. get everything through their um, pre market app application process, which is really onerous. Um, we've had to buy we've had to potentially buy like two hundred thousand dollars worth of machines to test the stuff and. Uh, uh, to, to meet the standards, uh, the, the directors. Well, here's, here's something. So this is something that Mark made, if you ever met Mark. Yep. Right over there, you did. And so this, you've got, um, you've got one, two, three, four, five for off. Or mm -hmm. one. Yeah. You've got three, makes it stronger to blue, and then three makes it stronger to red, and mm -hmm. then you go green. Uh, and then two heats it, so this is kind of heating it, preheating it. Yeah. You hold it, like as usual. It's and so it doesn't yeah. smell of anything. It doesn't smell of anything at all, and it's and it's pure weed. It's pure um, yeah, cannabis oil. I um, I was down at the a concert down at the down the hill in uh, Murphy's, California, which is has a great amphitheater, a concert venue. So I was down there to see. Um, uh, B-52s was the main line, and then I had, uh, then there was Berlin, and, uh, and um, what was it, uh, OM, OMG, uh, OMD, um, Orchestral Maneuvers, the dark, so 80s, you know, punky, um, new wave, it was, a, it was a hilarious time, but a couple chicks offered me a uh, um, uh, uh, draw on their, um, on their cannabis, uh, vape it's just pretty powerful i can tell you you know it's like it has an it, smoke. It, it made me cough and as you know if you if you cough it's a good hit so uh, <laughs> it hasn't had a smoke in almost five years yeah or or a drink actually of alcohol so i'm a little bit drunk rich has been drinking and ed is uh stone cold told so. you i catch up told you i catch up so yeah, so Richard, you might as well hear something from um, about me because because I'm pretty private. But you know, maybe Ed Ed can tell you you know an embarrassing well, story. Hang on, before before you do, Andy, please indulge a a, a, que a curiosity, a question. It's like so you two are good friends, but he's no Englishman. I can tell. So how and you went to school when you were like 14 years old? What what ha what what's that about? So. Um, my mother's actually English, okay. and uh, I, was, I grew up in New York City, and um, <clears throat> I had, uh, went to an English-style day school in New York, and then uh, they shipped me off to boarding school in England when I was 10 years old. <laughs> and then uh, I went all the way through till 24 when I graduated with my master's over there. Um, and uh, my accent's actually kind of in the middle. It, it, it does go fully English if I'm in England for a little bit, but I've been in America now for so long that it's it's become more and more Americanized. Yeah, he doesn't. I was like, I'm listening. I'm thinking, okay, I'm gonna hear another fucking English <laughs> guy, and like I I'm down there downstairs and refilling my drink and taking the smoke. I'm like, this, this is American. <laughs> this is no this is no Englishman, right? <laughs> well, that's 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 uh, that's it's, it's fabulous from the from from a sense that um, it gives me another facet in the complexity of Andy Curzon, actually. Yes. 
<laughs> no, I'm, I'm split right down the middle. And actually, Andy, we first met at the Design Technology Center at Eaton, um, uh, like, a, like a week or so before we met at the computer lab. Okay. Yeah, and then Andy and I ended up running around causing mayhem. Uh, uh, about right. <laughs> yeah, we used to we used to have a Chinese culture lessons together. Like so, when you do your A levels, you have like a it's called an option. And I think everyone I went for cooking as my first option. I didn't get it, so I got um, Chinese culture, and, and it was the only class that Ed and I ever had together. And yes. yeah, we got <laughs> banned from. <laughs> yeah, it was so bad. They would like stop. You can't sit there. No, anyway, it was one of those classic things. Well, um, well Ed, Ed, um, I I should say then that. Um, you know, my father is a German immigrant. He he was born in '38 in in which is now um, Szczecin, Poland, which was kind of a cool thing when I went to when I spoke at uh, Warsaw. This is in the previous part of the video when you watch it back. Um, so my dad was born there. He came over at like 14, 15 years old, 1952, and um, I don't speak German. Um, uh, he did not, uh, he can't, can you imagine coming as a, as a 14, 15 year old to America in the early fifties? I mean, yeah. have you seen the movies? It's like, he, he is the most diehard American boy you could ever imagine. He completely, you know, so many people, they come, but they want to hold on to their, you know, their root culture or their whatever. Not my dad. Not my dad. Yeah. No, he is an American. He is. He is a dot. You would. He doesn't. When I when I grew up, he still had a little bit of an accent, right? Not anymore. In, you know, he can still understand German perfectly, but he struggles with even speaking it. He can read it. He can understand it, but he he uh, he struggles in in talking it, speaking it anymore. That's how much he completely. <laughs> Um, he completely uh, integrated with American culture and American society because it's like, God damn it, we're going to America, we're going to be Americans. And that's my dad. Uh, Ed, can I get your take on something? Um, Richard and I were talking earlier about, um, it's not something I usually want to talk about, I just want to see your take on it. On um, So Kurt Doolittle got his account deleted and Richard got his other account deleted and he's been banned 17 times. Um, first, firstly, have you been banned? Uh, how many times? And then, like, what's your view on what's happening on Facebook at the moment? Well, I, I've been banned from Facebook twice, um, <clears throat> way back in the day, in 2005, 2006. Wow. Um, that was back when probably it was Mark Zuckerberg himself hitting the ban button because <laughs> it was, he only just opened it up beyond Harvard to other university students. And it was quite a different animal back then. It was, um, you know, basically a bunch of students running around, you know, having political debates and stuff like that. And I, I decided, I forget what I got banned the second time for, but the first time I was winding up a bunch of feminists. So I managed to get into a group of like 5,000 feminists. And uh, there was no feature on Facebook back then to search through the members and, and remove one of them. So they couldn't get rid of me and I was just winding them up and getting reported. So, <laughs> so it was, it was a kind of a different scene back then. Um, yeah. Ed, was, Ed was a notorious, like, um, anti, you know, feminist kind of troll. <laughs> back in the day. Like back when I was like 19, 20. Yeah. Um, but I, I don't know, like I've decided to stop using Facebook almost entirely about 18 months ago. I deleted every single post. I was actually off Facebook for three years as well before that. And then I tried coming back on and I was like getting sucked into, backed into the habit of like, you know, making posts on there and having debates with people. So about 18 months ago, I just simply deleted every single post I had apart from face uh, birthday messages. And um, I still read my, my timeline because there's a lot of interesting stuff that comes up on there because of the friends I know and I still use Facebook Messenger. But you know, as far as I'm concerned, Facebook since the beginning has been a tool for a particular part of the establishment, um, which I don't really want to assist. And there was always that kind of uncomfortableness in myself where I was 
being involved in that tool where at the same time, you know, I was quite enjoying and getting a lot of out of it. So um, I think just as I've gotten older, I've decided that there are other ways in which I can get the same benefits that Facebook was giving me without actually being properly engaged with it. You know, that said, you know, it's a difficult thing because at the end of the day, Facebook's a private corporation. So they can, you know, freely decide who gets to use their platform. Yeah. And that, okay. that libertarian argument, I think, is more important to me. Let me redirect on, let me redirect on that. And first, I want to uh, echo some things Ed said. So in 2014, um, I had, because of my blog, I had like about 10,000 um, followers and such, and I deleted it all because um, I just got disgusted with it. And I hated the trend where I would put up a blog post and uh, folks, instead of like engaging in the comments on my blog, would go to Facebook and they comment there. It was very harder to control because I have iron grip control on my blog. And so at a point I said, screw this, and I deleted it. Then I end up uh, going to Mexico for some months. I mean, off grid Mexico like way out at the very tip of Baja. And um, I had good internet though. It was line of sight, dish, solid bowl sized dish to a mountain and I got great internet. Um, and I thought, okay, let me start up again. So I did and since then I've been banned 17 times. And the thing is, is for me, is in, I think I'm going to echo something you were thinking as well. Why do I have a blog already? It's popular. It has, you know, it, at a at at its high point, you know, it would get a quarter million um, visits per month. It's much less than that now. Um, but I'm like, well, maybe it's much less than that because I've been like, you know zucking cock for a far too long and doing stuff or Facebook like driving traffic that they make ad revenue on and then they treat me like shit and it's like it's just today oh your post doesn't follow our community standards mm -hmm. you know what it's go fuck yourself Zuckerberg <laughs> I mean just go fuck yourself I don't do not ever have to contend with this on the blog because you know why I own the data. It's mine. And there are a million service providers who do WordPress all over the world. And I've never had one that said, well, we don't like your, your, what you publish on your blog. So we're not going to have you as a customer anymore, but that's never happened ever. And I don't expect it will. So, uh, the, so I've kind of in this last thing, so I had, because I get banned so much, and after the th third time or fourth time, something like that, then every ban is a every ban is a thirty day ban, and so uh, I've been I've spent about now over four hundred days this night since in the last four years, so a year out of four I've spent ban status proudly. Um, uh, and I don't, I'm, I'm never like contrite about it. It's go fuck yourself, Zuckerberg. <laughs> go fuck yourself. Look at, look, just look at that face. I mean, that is, I I'm not even going to go there. But um, uh, I, when I lived in France, um, the, you know, the French showed me books with pictures in what the Algerians did to some of them in the how they how they suffocated how they were suffocated let me <laughs> let me put it that way right and no it's not with their hand <laughs> so um, well, let me um go ahead. I, I you know I, I think there's a couple of caveats to the fact that facebook's a private organization and they can make whatever policies they want um you know first of all what i don't understand is They've got, they've invented, they've innovated the concept 
why is it so hard for other companies to essentially duplicate Facebook with a different set of policies? I know there's a handful of them out there, but they're just nowhere near as good. And I'm sure that the, the overheads and the man hours in actually running a Facebook that doesn't try to be as involved as they do is actually not that, not that bad. Um, so I'm, I'm like, without understanding why it hasn't been properly duplicated, things like, you know, Twitter and Facebook and things like that and YouTube, um, I don't want to... I think, uh, I think there's a simple, I think there's a simple uh, answer to that. And it's for the same reason that both, right, both people on the right and left, you know, they, their ideology is different about whatever, um, um, you know, sky gods they worship, whether it's a, uh, whether it's a mysterious one or whether it's a state, mm -hmm. they still worship gods. And when you worship gods, uh, you want to be protected. And in, in terms of society, and in, in particular, when you are removed from like a tribe or a village, you know, mm -hmm. a small sphere where everyone has an influence upon everyone else, right? They know if you're displeased about something and they yeah. might, it might give them pause. It's like, okay, all right, Richard's an asshole, but he, this pisses him off. So, you know, this kind of push and pull. But when you remove it and you get into this big ass shit, it's no different than has been going on for a hundred years since uh, women's suffrage. Politics was pretty easy before the cunts got the vote. And so, um, so everyone want two things. They want to be safe, secure, protected. But most of all, everyone wants to live at the expense of everyone else. Right? Yeah. And so what, how this transfers to a thing like Facebook is that it, it synthesizes or, um, or, or, you know, simulates. It's, it's kind of like VR. It's, a, vertic it's a, a virtual reality simulation where people actually think they have influence and power when they don't. And, mm -hmm. and, and Facebook encourages it, like report it. And that's then part of the reason why I checked out from Facebook. If you, re if you report it, you're congratulated over and over. We're glad you did. Even if they say you report it, cause I've tested it out, you know, just to see what, what is it that people are getting? They're getting patted on the back. It doesn't matter even, you can report anything. You could report a picture of lilies growing in the field and Facebook would say, we're glad you did this. We're, we're, we're helping you. And our, you're, you know, what you do is important. And while this didn't violate our standards, um, uh, we, we, we thank they, everybody. So they can report anything and get, and get their dick sucked. You know, um, and it's, it's, uh, that's what is really going on behind the scenes. And in my 17 bands, I pretty much tied it because many of them were over comments in other threads and stuff. 100% cunt, 100%. You know, people, people hate me because I throw out the word cunt all the time. And I do. And I, Andy's a cunt, my, my friend Keith's a cunt, but they're proper cunts. So the thing is, they're a proper cunt, that they're, they're, it's good, right? But there, you use it in a context where it's a bad, stinky cunt. In a context. It's context, yes. Frame, well, I, framing, uh, right? I have, uh, I have two other caveats to the, um, you know, the Facebook being a private organization thing, and that is, you know, first of all, it, it's, it's not just this. Um, there have been other patterns of this nature where people are being targeted by, you know, backbone infrastructure of the internet too. But that's, that's pretty serious stuff. You know, if like, let's say ICANN decided to delist your domain, you know, that's straight censorship from, you know, how do you define what the internet really is? You know, it's like, so I don't think there's a proper allegory for like a historical precedent on, you know, what, how that should be treated, but. 
has has I can has I can ever summarily delete a domain. I I know that sometimes the the feds can take it over. Mm -hmm. uh, either it's like a, a, a so they can do it two ways. Either either post judgment or they can do it on a on a pre judgment writ. If a judge decides like yeah, I mean they're like it's a domain that deals in sex trafficking of minors. Pretty clear. So we're going to take it for now, uh, you know, pending final judgment. But I, I think, I've, I think I've never I, seen I've never seen an example of I can I can doing something like that outside the bounds of you know uh, a federal crime and with respect to the First Amendment. So, um, but but that's that's kind of the road we're heading towards, um, which is really concerned. The other thing I would say is like you know, we're getting more and more polarized. And part of that is because like, you know, I read, I'm friends with some left people on Facebook. Like it's as if they're living on a different world. And the only yeah. way to solve that is through communication with each other. And, you know, by, by banning people who say things that you don't particularly like and not engaging with their views, um, you know, that's going to get worse and worse in the future too. I mean, yeah, I, I can't, in the last five years, there's been, it is almost, almost as if there's like two separate realities of what's going on in the world. And, um, you know, they're, they're angry with each other. They're, I can speak to, I can speak to my experience to that. Uh, Richard, what is, it, so. Hang on, just Zuckerberg <laughs> is a child. Really, I mean, um, uh, I think he's a child with, uh, with um, uh, Asperger's or autism. And so, and he needs to be sent to bed without any dinner. <laughs> uh, I mean, it, it's really uh, looking at what they do and how Facebook operates and the messages they send you. I mean, it's like they, they, uh, it's all, all the messaging is geared towards child level. Oh, we thank you for what you're doing. It's like patting a little kid on the back. Um, so that that's what I wanted to interject there. I think you had something to say, Andy. Yeah, I'm kind of like Ed. So my uh, my good friend Tiggs, his name's Rob, but we call him Tiggs because Tigger from... Uh... <laughs> anyway, <clears throat> Winnie the Pooh. Anyway, he's, he's sort of... Oh, I wouldn't say he likes to be called left-leaning, but he's definitely got... So, you know, he's anti-Brexit, he hates Trump, he hates, you know, he loves Corbyn, he, you know, anyway, all of these things. And that permeates through to the feeds that he sees on Facebook, the, yeah. the, the, um, the Guardian articles he put But at the same time, he's really open to libertarian arguments or, or like bordered arguments, you know, but he's not so swayed by the ones. Anyway, so there's him. And then there's... Kurt, and then there's you guys one by one, and then there's all sorts of different people on my feed. So when I when I put something out, I put something about ADHD last time. I usually put something that's very unpolitical and definitely irreligious, like nothing to do with religion. But to do with the political stuff, I find my biggest task or my self-proclaimed um, responsibility is to try and communicate in such a way or allow this gap to be like sh shrunk between let's say Tiggs who's the most left and then someone like uh, maybe Kurt who's the most right whoever might you know and kind of work out what's going on and try and get them to to see like the, the left cannot see that the way justice is seen and production as fair and property and all, all, all that picture just doesn't make it's not it doesn't make sense to them and the right thing no no one sec the right thing the left are just bonkers and it's just it's just so wrong. They're seeing different pictures. They need to stop calling each other idiots because that's just the stupidest thing. It's not helping anyone. Anyway, so that's that's where I'm at with it. Are, is is that is that a, is that a, a, is that an indictment, uh, Andy? Because I, I call it, it. I can't help it, and I I agree that it gets me nowhere. I mean, nobody is going to be convinced by saying you're a moron when I do that because my, my audience, you know, on my blog and Facebook for the most part is uh, is people from the right politically. But what I like most about them actually, and I've come around, you know, I used to be, I used to be uh, very um, antagonistic 
but religion and religious beliefs. I grew up in a um, in a fundamentalist Baptist uh, household. Ed probably knows uh, some something about that, uh, um, at least um, from hearing uh, people talk about it. Uh, I don't think it's a thing in England. I'm not sure. Um, it's not. <laughs> yeah. But um, so, Richard, stop there. Stop there. What was that like in terms of your just your religious practice from, let's say, age four to age ten? Well, it didn't start till I was ten. So, okay. so, I, so I'm a weird, I'm a weird mutt uh, hybrid kind of thing. My dad's a German immigrant Lutheran. My mother is uh, a uh, Idaho Mormon. So a put them. What do you get when you cross a, a Lutheran with a Mormon? <laughs> so um so i was blessed in the um in the uh, famous uh, uh mormon temple on the hills of oakland you can still see it if you drive up 880 up there it's a big white building um i went to you know some i went to all these churches when i was a kid and my mom dabbled with jehovah's witness and then eventually they found fundamentalism so it's the classic thing of like, okay, this isn't right. So let's go to this one. Let's go to this one. Let's go to this one. But you never ask the question, is it all bullshit? <laughs> so it took me to say it's all bullshit. But so, and that happened, you know, in my early twenties where I like, and I became a very like vocal and because I like to write and everything. And I got, very critical and very condescending actually very not just condescending but insulting um but you know and andy's andy's like shtick all the time i i don't know i don't i don't even know how to frame your shtick andy let's put it that way <laughs> so so but the thing is is that is that you always you always need to leave um, doors open in your mind that you may be wrong or not not even if you're wrong, but but also maybe not the best approach or maybe not as effective or maybe at a point you become you become insufferable and pileal and all of all of those things and that's what happened to me about religion because I said I looked at so what happened is the left like doubles down inch mile cake and eat it too you know never enough we want more 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 and we want we want all we 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 want to bear all the benefits none of the costs for any trade-offs anything like that and i'm like and i look at the destruction of society where the uh, destruction of families literally I mean, people out there going like, oh, we turned our four-year-old boy into a four-year-old girl. It took a lot of paperwork, right? Well, I hope she grows up and kills you in your sleep. Um, and, uh, I, and I mean that sincerely, actually. And, I, and some of these parents are going to face enormous repercussions by screwing with prepubescent children's um, um, uh, sense of, of yeah uh, and li li literally for an like an attention see it, it's it's like calling your kid some obnoxious name that you can barely spell it's just you know it's a life curse for attention just on the part of the parent pure fucking narcissism yes it is i agree i agree i think i think like finger wagging and stuff like this is kind of pointless no, not having a go at it it's just because it's so obviously bonkers and it's, it's like the fact that we have to defend this kind of crap is, well, is ridiculous isn't it look at look at what both the left and the right are doing right now if you know something about history and andy you know about you know origin of consciousness and the breakdown of the bicameral man and i Surely hope to what the guy we we're talking to. Surely hope to get him on one of these. Ian McGilchrist, yeah. McGilchrist, right? Uh, not the he's the author. Um, Julian Jaynes is the author. But it's like there's this reversion to, to, to bicamerality, 
And because what happened is everybody's heard of like the oracles of Delphi, right? Yeah. And so what they were like, they were like essentially kept in an unconscious state, left brain, right brain separation, uh, 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 right brain talks to left brain like a god and it's interpreted as it's a god right it's yeah, yeah, actually fully oral it's fully oral so it's like someone talking to you but it is one side of your hemisphere talking to the next and the greeks uh, uh figured this out because as people became conscious which is out of a state of schizophrenia where you actually have left right brain integration uh so what the left and right are doing now is you see this all over YouTube and news reports is they're propping up children to, to speak their words to you like this, uh, like this Asperger's autistic uh, chick in Sweden. Yeah. Greta, Greta. That's such a trope. Like but you also, know, but also yeah. the, the right are doing it too. Uh, what is Sof and all these other, it, and I asked the question, I'm like, why are they using children? The children did not come up with these ideas. The children are regurgitating the ideas from adults, but it is a, it's, a, it's a different platform that is designed to get people to go, whoa, you yeah. know? And I, I, I firmly hold to the belief that children should be seen and not heard, you know? And, uh, that was my grandparents' um, motto for my father. That was quite funny. But he was brought up quite Victorian. By the way, have you, have you guys heard of this woman? I love saying this woman and not saying the name because I've got no idea. But she goes around America and she talks about, it's, it's three letters like NME or NWW. And it's, it's like, we don't need to have a budget. We just print money and we have projects and we have dreams. And what? And she'll probably get a hundred, she'll probably get two million YouTube views for that because that is what we're dealing with. We are dealing with a culture that that at, probably going back to a hundred years, but at least in uh, you know in very vociferously since the 1950s and 60s is intent on destroying the probity, the critical mindedness and probity of an individual. So that all you have to do is offer them candy and they don't care if, if you had to kill someone to get them the candy. They just want the candy uh, to, to use a, an analogy. Hey, I will uh, say, Andy, honestly, Andy, like, uh, take it with, take it with, uh, uh, with Ed for a while. I'm going to yep. fill the drink. Perfect. Perfect. Go on, Ed. I mean, <laughs> America was a, a genuine attempt to have a functioning democracy slash republic and it, it failed and i honestly don't know if there is a genuine way to have a democracy without suffering from those uh inevitable issues um where you just get you know an, an ex a larger expanse of government that tries to get involved in all kinds of different things and you know fueled by essentially misinformed people on the, on a grand scale what if you had a government let's say you had a, a government that had uh, control over only a certain amount of area of land or people so let's say you know a hundred thousand people or x square kilometers Wouldn't well that's that what they tried to do in america they, they wrote the constitution with the idea that it would exactly prescribe what the federal government was allowed to do and then the states underneath that would compete in a marketplace of governance um, for for people and capital and things like that. And uh, in, in 1955, work. Cedric, um, a guy called John T. Flynn read a book called The Decline of the American Republic. And in that book, there's a chapter called Four Magic Words. And he talks about how um, the judges were packed when some died. He, you know, he packed them over, over years, F FDR. And how he reinterpreted interstate commerce yeah. and general welfare. They're the four magic words, interstate commerce and general welfare. And uh, yeah, I found that really illuminating in terms of like the breakdown of um, the state power. 
Well, it goes back before that. So the real, the real point, the Julius Caesar moment in America was Abraham Lincoln. He essentially gave the sole power to interpret the Constitution to the Supreme Court. And ever since then, it's just been downhill. Um, you know, he removed the ability for state nullification or secession. And that was supposed to be a final check. I mean, truly, the final check is a Second Amendment. But, um, you know, that requires quite a dire situation to be used. Um, but, uh, yeah, ever since Abraham Lincoln, it's just been a, a slow unraveling of the, the limitations of federal power. Um, and, uh, yeah. Well, take me through, take me through Abe Lincoln, kind of like, you know, your, your film in terms of a three, three to four minute sort of spiel on let's say the negative side, especially of Lincoln and the evidence of it. So, so he basically, so it, him himself or the situation around him? Uh, a bit of both, a bit of both. So, so the, the way it really went down was that almost from the start of America in the late 1700s, um, the, the federal government was being used by the Northern states to, um, fund projects out of tariffs on made Southern goods um, that really benefited the North, not the South. So almost right from the beginning, there was this friction being caused um, by what the South thought was an unfair relationship. And that was in part because right from the start, there were people who were already picking away at the document of the constitution and trying to figure out ways to expand its uh, prescribed power. And it, it kind of, there was a bit of give and take. So for example, the, the Southern states got the Fugitive Slave Act. Put um, in. Uh, just, just telling Richard, we're talking about um, Abraham Lincoln in the- I uh, heard it, I heard it, I heard it. I have, I have quibbles, I have quibbles. Okay, but carry on then. to finish. So, um, yeah, so the, the, you know, there are things like the Fugitive Slave Act, which perpetuated slavery you know, beyond where it was actually economically feasible and you know, the agricultural revolution taking place, slavery became basically more and more just a, you know, not really a viable thing. And uh, you know, it's, not, it's not like we suddenly woke up after you know, thousands of years and had a moral epiphany that slavery was bad. It was, exactly. it, it's you know, like, like all these things, the left wing likes to paint it as a, you know, they wind hard enough that they you know, go where they want. But the truth is it was the economics that changed. Exactly. And um, it perpetuated in America beyond its economic viability due to the federal government, um, including a bill which uh, Abraham Lincoln himself voted for, which is the Fugitive Slave Act. Yeah. And um, it was never originally about slavery, the Civil War. Um, that was just one issue of many. The South tried to It was about, it was about taxes on um, industrial goods being lower and farming and, and uh, being higher. Right and, and the, the, the not allowing them to secede. It's basically, it's, it's it's more it's more fundamental and essential than that. Is the industrial revolution is what killed slavery because uh, you could you could do factories and machinery and all of the child labor stuff is bullshit too. I mean, it actually it actually helped. Uh, child delinquency, um, especially in England, um, where where it got going. You know, we're talking way back. Um, yeah. But um, um, and and also it, it also helped disease greatly because you know they came up with gizmos that could wash clothes and you know rid them of the bacteria that made um, humans not like vermin. Um, because they have to be covered up. And um, so they, they, you know, this all goes um, so on and so forth. But, but, uh, but you know, cl cleanliness, uh, you know, and, and a certain, uh, certain realm of, of that um, certainly helped push society along in terms of not being a drag. So you don't have all of the thing, but Ed is exactly right in terms of it, right in my opinion. I don't want to be, I don't want to sound condescending. Um, 
and because Andy will get on my case if I do that. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I have I have a theory about what happens there that I came up with. I guess I, I my own original theory. Okay. So um, there are reservoirs of information about how to best interact with our environment. Um, the first most obvious one and the slow, slowest reacting one is the genes. Yeah. Um, and then there's, um, you know, an epigenetics, which is the turning on and off of genes. And finally, there is culture. Epigenetics is bullshit. Really? I didn't I yeah, look into it's that. Pretty, it's pretty much bullshit. It is, it, it really, it's more environment than epigenetics. Can I just explain something, Richard? Because yeah. I know a little bit of science on this, right? If you're looking at the, the, the spools on your genes, certain behaviors and certain experiences, they wind and unwind the spools. And this has been shown time and time again. So this is basically, it's, it's not, you can call it epigenetics. It's not really, it's just genetics. It's, it's showing. It no, no, let me finish. Let me finish. Right, it's, it's, exactly. Let me finish. Exactly. Awesome. It's just, it's, it's genetics, but there's variation, but I it's think it's expressing stuff. different parts of those genetics. Yeah. 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 Basically an on off switch for, for the genes It actually gets past its hereditary. So if your grandfather lived through a famine, um, you will have evidence of that in your DNA. Yeah. Maybe, um, maybe, maybe you will, maybe you won't. But the point is, is like, so this is, it's funny to me that everyone talks about epigenetics in terms of human beings, right? When you go when you go out to the wild and you study animals, right? Um, show me epigenetics there. Why? How? Show me a uh, show me a female lion, for instance, that doesn't like hunt for her dude who's laying under the tree. <laughs> um, and her cubs, right? That's her job. Uh, sh anything, anything in the wild, um, it is, it is, it's pretty much genetically, it's like ninety nine percent over. And we only get into this like uh, epigenetics is a way to like explain away what is called free will. Now, maybe you know, I disagree with Sam Harris on this. You know, he says there's no free will. I, I'm not sure what Daniel Dennett thinks about it because I can't get interested in, in Daniel as brilliant as he is. And he, I should read more of him uh, because he's, he's intensely interested in consciousness and so on. But, you know, I use the, I, I don't like the word tabula rasa. Um, but at the same time, I'm like, I understand how, but I, what I've always said about free will is that is that what's the difference between free will and an uh, an AI who thinks its will is free? What is how do you make a differentiation there? I think well, it just uh, depends on what what the actual process difference is. We, we don't know that. I don't think we understand well, what what, 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 I'm, is. what I'm getting to is that is that we have the if you do not change a human's environment very much, like they're born here, like Immanuel Kant, right? He was born and he never was more than 40 miles, I think 40 miles. Hmm. Maybe it's kilometers, I don't know. That would be about 30 miles. Um, <laughs> um, away from where he was born his entire life. I've lived all over the world. I'm, I'm, there are traits. Uh, I am more like my third brother in the way we, uh, not third, yeah, I, I'm the oldest, so I had four boys. So uh, <clears throat> me and the number three are more alike than number two and number four. Um, so, and there's very, there's mannerisms that you can say like, yeah, Richard's like Stacy, um, and that's a, Stacy is a boy's name, and David is like Michael, and, and more like Michael. But yeah, we all get along, and we all grew up in the same rough environment we've gone on, but we didn't spin it out until we we're like 18. And so I'm thinking that epigenetics is like so take someone. Okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna drop her name, Andy, with you, Megan. Right, she's she's full Japanese. 
I mean, her parents, her grandparents, da, 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 she's full Japanese, but she was born here, right? But I, I lived in Japan for five years, so I noted things about her early on that are like totally Japanese chick. But, and she said, she says, I'm not Nihongo, right? I'm not Japanese, right? Well, she is. She is, and in fact, even even like some things I'm not going to get into, which we everyone I've talked to, I've talked to you about it, and so on. But it is it is it, epigenetics is I think it's a fool's errand. So okay, I think well, it's it's uh yeah. Let me let me finish my theory off because actually epigenetics is not central to the point. So the re the real central point is that these reservoirs of information, such as you know, genes or culture on how to best interact with our environment around us um, is, uh, you know, it's, it, it is by definition a memory. And by definition, it's going to have a lag from changes in the environment. Yeah. So the changes aren't immediately going to be reflected in that body of information. No, I, 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 my, my, my theory is, is that a lot of left-wing politics you know, the slavery thing being one or, um, you know, feminism being another is a result of a frustration with culture lagging the economic changes that are happening from capitalism. So ironically, they blame capitalism for a lot of their ills when actually it's, it is the foremost driver of the changes that they're trying to take credit for. Um, so yeah, that's, that's my theory in a nutshell. Oh, okay. okay. Thanks for... Uh, Thanks for clarifying because, um, yeah, um, it, it kind of goes hand in hand with what I was saying. It's, 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 it's will. Now, I, I, I can draw the word free. It's will of uh, humans. They get together and they figure out that, see, humans are the one um, uh, principal species, I think probably only ones, who can be dropped into any range of environment that's not just automatically death. Like, no, you can't drop us into the water. You know, we don't have gills. We can't survive there. But humans live, it's amazing. You look at it, think about it. Humans live from the equator to the Arctic and Antarctic circle. And from sea level in the highest village in the world is 16,000 feet. Now that is 3,000 feet over, that's in Peru. I forget the name of it. Um, that's 3,000 feet higher than what is considered, 13,000 feet is about, that's where you typically need, a, so if you're gonna fly, for example, if you're flying an airplane, right? Mm -hmm. You're up to 13,000 feet, without a need of pressurization and oxygen, right? But they live at 16,000 feet, so they're pushing it three more thousand feet. So from equator to yeah. the poles, from sea level to 16,000 feet, and everything in between. And it is only our will and our ability to, to craft things that allow us to survive. Yeah, it's the ability to solve problems and communicate yes. your solutions to other people. You and, know? I, and, I, and it offends me when, it, it, when people talk about epigenetics in that sense of term, it's will. It's will, it's the will to survive. Okay. Well, I'll tell you, so I went to Ladakh uh, a few years ago. Um, and um, if you know Ladakh, I think is at 12,500 feet. And we were up around there, probably ranging up to like 14,000 feet. Uh -huh. my, my mother and I, you know, when, I, when the airplane's door opened, I, I felt the pressure and it was a little concerning. I was like, I don't think I can breathe this altitude. Within three or four hours, I was totally acclimatized. And so was my mom. Yeah. Whereas my sisters and my dad, could they went for the whole two weeks we were there? They they never got used to it. They were suffering the whole time. Well, it's what you know why the uh, you know the Everest climbers they spend like some number of weeks up at um, I think the 
the base camp that they run from is near 20,000. So, and what happens is I guess your, your body, uh, builds a lot more red blood cells, which, so it's more, so, so what oxygen you do breathe in is more efficiently transferred. So it's actually, it's interesting is the, the, um, the weakness is that is getting rid of the carbon dioxide. Yeah. Um, it, it, they have, it's really hard to get rid of carbon dioxide for some people and they get acidosis in their blood, which disrupts all of their cell functions. Well, um, you know, they probably, they probably want to just keep that carbon dioxide in them because otherwise, you know, it's going to destroy the planet eventually. You know, it's, there you go. <laughs> it's a joke. I just, just yesterday I was at, a, I, I, I spent the weekend at my brother's house in Placerville, California. And, and, uh, we went out to lunch, uh, before I, before we parted ways and I left and, so I, 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 I didn't want to drive, uh, with any booze. So he had a beer. I had, um, I had a iced tea and they, she, first of all, law in California, now you can't just put a straw in a drink. So he had to ask me. <laughs> and then when she, I said, yeah, I said, yes, destroy the planet. Give me a straw, please. <laughs> Cause I always do that. And you know, if I yep. have a cocktail drink with a swizzle stick, you know, I say, hey, save the planet, use the, recycle the, use the swizzle stick and number two. What are you driving at the moment, Richard? What car? What's that? A BMW X5. Okay. It's a good car. Yeah. I have it tricked. Have you ever seen my Baja Beamer? It has a, it has a two inch lift and an inch and a half uh, thanks. So I have big ass truck tires and steel wheels on a beam on a Beamer. You haven't seen that? I have to send you a picture. Andy. I drove it all the way down to the tip of Baja. I have a picture of it sitting on the absolute tip of the Baja Peninsula. Hmm. Yeah. No, I like cool cars. Um, so uh, what was I? You got me off. What was it? What was I? <laughs> <laughs> well, let, let me just, let me just rewind quickly. So, um, I, uh, so there's something else you said that I really wanted to respond to, and that is, you know, I, I think the thing that bothers me the most about the left wing politics is that there's this unmistakable, unmistakable stink of dishonesty in it. Like it feels like everything they say is has a different motive than what they're pretending. And for some reason, that just really rubs me up the wrong way. I uh, haven't been able to find out why exactly, but it's beyond lying. Right? It's beyond lying. See, you see, it's not, and it's beyond. It, here's two things. Number one, it is beyond lying. Lies are lies. Everybody lies. We all lie, almost every day. We, you know, how are you doing? Oh, great. When your life sucks, you just told a lie, right? So we all lie. But is it operative? Um, mm. Does it really affect someone else? You know, if you lie to affect someone else, then you're bordering on fraud, especially if you're going to get some benefit from that, right? Mm -hmm. Whether it's whether it's technical legal fraud or whatever, it's still kind of fraudulent, right? But in on in terms of the left, it's beyond lying. Mm -hmm. So it yeah. goes to dishonesty. All right. It goes even beyond. All right. So let's start with the good stuff first. So if you're honest, if you're a very honest person, right? Even though you lie sometimes, right? You want your main life narrative and how you deal with others to be, for the most part, very honest. And you make strives to make the honesty integrated. This is a particular, particularly important concept and word. It needs to be integrated so that no matter which way you look at the network of honesty, it all, it all works. It's it, okay. So if you're, if you are, if you are honest and integrated in your honesty, so even though a person could like look at that web of honesty, integrated honesty, and pick out a lie here or there. 
They will understand it. They will understand yeah. the context of it because you are a very integrated, honest person. Now, right, and the problem with the left-wing stuff is that the, the, the dishonesty that is so fundamental that it can't be... Let's flip that around. Not all, it's the, the lies of the left aren't really important. Lies are lies. They're just, they're just statements of, of unfactuals. You know, and so, uh, but here's what they do is they weave it into dishonesty. And what it is, the reason it's so clever, it's fully integrated dishonesty. So the, so it in juxtaposition to what I said before, all of the weave of, where all the weave of, integrated honesty where your little lies can make sense, right? A weave of a fully integrated dishonesty becomes the same thing flipped on its head where all their lies make sense. Yeah. So think about think about it in that context. It's fully integrated honesty versus fully integrated dishonesty <laughs> so it's it's not just clever lying or anything it is it is Richard, a, you sound like you've been speaking to yasuhiko well no yasuhiko and i go back to the same you still you have to read the book it's look here i'll show you so ed um yes 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 well, and yeah, I, I, I agree with that. that. And the problem is, is there isn't I really. The, I got that in the um, in the early '90s, and I've never backed off because it always rings true. And that it's good because it's I just never I, I it's never been falsified. You know, I and I've been bannering with people for two decades, three decades on the internet, and nobody ever falsifies the notion and i'm not talking really right or left i'm talking honesty versus dishonesty and what I, the point i'm making is that they are both highly integrated so there we go i think um you know it's it's a shame because one of the base impulses at least supposedly of the left is caring about the people who are worse off in society and there's definitely a place for that in a functioning society but even that, I mean, I feel, you know, Jordan Peterson had a really interesting talk I, I heard him say once where he, he was involved in socialist party politics way back when he was young. And he said, even in there, like he could just tell that the people there were not being honest. They didn't really give a shit about the unfortunate people in society. They hated the rich. They stroke their own egos and, you know. Virtue signal. Yeah. No. And yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. I know, honestly, other than like, you know, a fat hit of LSD, I don't know what would fix that kind of dysfunction in a person. Um, <laughs> but guys, yeah. on that note, I'm going to hit the hay, but um, yeah, yeah. great chatting I, I with you. And um, Ed will have you back about, on. This is about good. So let's uh, anyone have any last words to say to uh, everybody? Because this is going yeah, to. Yeah, I want you both to come to the. I want you. I want you both to come to the um, Portugal conference well, next year. I'll be there. I'll be there. Okay. I'll, I'll stir shit up, right? I, you know. yeah, Ed, you've got to fly to Portugal next year at some point in maybe April. Yeah. Okay. And I might see you in England in a couple of weeks, Andy. Sounds good, man. Have a good night. Richard, it's good to meet you. Yeah, yeah. You too, Ed. It was, it was great to... Uh, I, didn't know, I didn't know Andy had any cool friends whatsoever, so it was... Uh, it you know, one thing he won't tell you is that I'm the one who got him introduced to libertarianism way back in the day. Well, you, you, know, <laughs> you know, I already, I already told everybody he's a cunt, so, you know, no, yeah. no, you know, <laughs> there, right? No. <laughs> but you know what? Andy is, uh, Andy is very honest, right? So uh, that's uh, that's why I think I, I think I believe I am too, and I think that um, I think that Andy and I have this kind of affinity weirdly for the last few months that just works like that, 
And now he's like, this is my best friend, Ed, and you come on, I'm like, duh, <laughs> duh. <laughs> so, um, so yeah, it's, it's, a, it's, it's, it's quite sad that an Englishman uh, has, has all of his best friends with Americans. I, I, <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm ending the recording right now. <laughs>